Chicago. Hold up, when you tell me, man, I be out in these streets. Yeah, get it popping quick, 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 quick. That's a feeling of another whip. Jumped out the whip. Now we ain't got no problems. Easy. Easy. Ain't nothing that gon' stop us. We can feel it, but they all let it kill it. So get it, tell them all that get it. We can feel it, and it's all alright. Good evening, good evening, good evening, everybody. Good evening. Let me hear some noise. I know that you're in the house and you're alive. You're absolutely welcome to Power, Sex, Money, where we listen from real people with real stories and real solutions. And it's good to see your faces today. Smile at your neighbor, because you're looking at me. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's really good. It's good to see you in the pews, because if you didn't come, it would have been a bit lonely talking to the pews and the cameras alone, but it's good to have you in the house today. So go ahead and turn to your neighbor. Say hi to your neighbor on the right. Mm -hmm. Say hi to your neighbor on the left. Hi, neighbor. Hi, neighbor. Now tap the person in front of you and say hi, neighbor, hi. at the front. <laughs> then turn behind at the person who just tapped you and say hello as well. <laughs> yes, that's very good. I know sometimes it's awkward to say hello to strangers, but you need to try. That's how we make friends. My name is Draz. And I work with Power 104.1 FM all about love. Let me hear some noise. Woo! Yep, yep, yep. That's the spirit. <laughs> mm -hmm. And my name is Paula. Together, yep, we have yep. the awesome opportunity of hosting one of the best shows, if you ask me. The mm -hmm. best show. One of the best shows. Mm -hmm. So after Eki's Madness and some laughter yeah. in the morning. Yeah. We are the mature ones. You bring maturity to you, yes. yes. We bring the maturity. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we host the bridge together on the station that's all about love. I like to say that we throw around some love to your day. Yeah, yeah, so we absolutely. get your day and say, let's sprinkle some love. Yeah. So we pray together. Yeah. We worship. We talk about all of life. About we talk about food. Every That's Tuesday. the best part, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. We talk about food. We talk about growing kids, even I. Talk yeah, about yeah, 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 yeah. We talk yeah. about marriage. We talk about being single. Even yeah. I, who's not single. <laughs> Absolutely. We do that. But you're welcome to Power Sex Money once again. I'd like to welcome a very special group of people. The yep. people joining us online. Let's make some noise for them. Come on. Let's online, do online, online. You're absolutely welcome. 
You're welcome, especially mm -hmm. if you're joining us on the Wachocho Church app. Did you know? Tell me. It's absolutely free. Free, free, mm -hmm. free, free. And Who doesn't like free things? Yeah, nobody. <laughs> nobody, nobody doesn't like free things. But yes, we absolutely encourage you to download the Wachocho Church app. Do you have it? I have the Watoto app. I have to. Do you know why I have the app? Mm -hmm. One of the reasons. I know there's like a lot going on. I can catch the summons, all the live broadcasts and everything. But I can also listen to Power FM That's right there. That's <laughs> it. That's it. That's it. So download the Watoto Church app. If there's something that looks another color away from white and black, don't do it. It's not the it's one. It's a scam. <laughs> yeah. Don't do it. But it's absolutely good to know you're here. There's another group of... Special Absolutely. People. So if you are in this auditorium right now and you're here for your very, very first time, we don't want to embarrass you. We just want yeah. to recognize you and you are our special guest. Please raise your hand up. We just want to know that you are there. Is there yes, anyone so who's here for the very, very first time? Nice. Please. Oh, no, no. <laughs> Mark, I know you. <laughs> yes, I see hands over there. You are very, 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 very welcome to Power Sex Money, where we talk about real people with real stories and real solutions. We hope you're going to have a great time with us. But we, ju we don't just have first time guests in this place, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There's the online people who are watching us for the very first time on YouTube mm -hmm. and Facebook, I think, right? Exactly. So if you're watching us online and it's the very first time for you to join us for Power Sex Money, just get into the comment section. Let us know that you're joining us. There's a group of lovely people that are waiting to just connect with you. Say hello, make you feel welcome and all of that. But Drez, we're a little bit too cold. Eh? I know. There's someone that I want to shout out. I know. But the moment I shout him out, he has to give us a bit. Yeah. That's going to get us a little warmed up. Because his name, name, his name is not cold. His name is not cold. His name has dry joke coming up. Yeah. Because Drez is the queen of those <laughs> No, friends. no, no, no. Paula <laughs> is the queen of dry jokes. But DJ Flames, Flames. is in the house. Can we hear the Flames? Yeah. So we DJ want to hear Flames, you. He yes. just said that DJ Flames is the only cool person. Yeah. Who doesn't have the luxury of saying he's cool. <laughs> Get it? No? Okay. So, <laughs> I told you who the queen of dry jokes was, but yeah, she exposed okay. herself. <laughs> All right. So one of the things that's happening yeah. around church, and this is one of the reasons I love church, because we get to be plugged into very dope stuff. Absolutely. If you've just finished your university, you're just fresh out of campus, and you'd like an opportunity to get to know what the marketplace is about, yeah. right? We off there's a program called Launchpad. They had to offer you a beautiful experience to connect with people who have been in the marketplace before you, yeah. but also to just give you skills and allow you to network properly. Yeah. Launchpad is the place to be, and in case you'd like to join that, how do we join that? Right outside mm -hmm. this auditorium, there's a table that's set up, and there's someone there who can share information with you. Yep. If you think that the Launchpad is for you, if you're waiting for graduation, this is an opportunity for you to network with people who can actually help you before graduation, after graduation. So go to the information table and you'll find out all the information that you need about Launchpad right there. But this is Power Sex Money and I know we are in the social media age. We would like to remind you that you can tweet about this. You can tell everybody on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram that we are at Pototo Church downtown and the hashtag we are using is hashtag Power Sex Money with a capital P, a capital S and a capital M. Power Sex Money. No other hashtag apart from that one is the one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we are all about love, right? Yes, we are. We are all about love. Guys, we're all about show us some love. That was all loud enough love. because when we love people, we give. So we're all about Okay, yeah, so better. we'd like to just, I said earlier that we get love and sprinkle it to your day. Yeah, absolutely. So we'd like to just sprinkle some love to you. Yeah. So yeah. we're going to be winning ourselves something. Something, 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 Who wants something. something, anything. Shang there we go. Hey. All right. So you have to have speed. So see, yes. there's a group of people, and I'd probably be those people <laughs> who are like, oh, this is so awkward. I can't put up my hand, but I really want it. I want it. I'd probably. <laughs> You'd be one of them. <laughs> I know. I'd probably be one of them. But yes, we're giving you an opportunity to get something because, again, we love you. Yes. Now, it's going to be on first come, first serve. So, you, it's a game of speed. If mm -hmm. you can get up on this stage quicker than anyone, once you realize that you have the answer to the question, you come yeah. through and you're going to win something, right? 
Yeah, now it's Power FM. We're all about love, drugs and die. Yeah. That, that is where we spend. Yeah, we couldn't ask yeah. you any question <laughs> other than, you know, questions related to Power FM. Yes. yes. The others that will come, but here we go. Yeah. You want to go so first? If you, yeah, let me go first. All right. If you have the answer to this question, just raise your way up on stage and the something you're going to win, I dare say, is not something ordinary. Mm. So just do it, okay? So the question is, which weekday show, are we listening? Mm -hmm. Which weekday show has a prayer segment and what is it called? Which weekday, weekday show, show on Power FM has a prayer segment and what is it called? And what is it called? Friends, it's okay. You can come, then you come. start thinking. Come from, yeah. Yeah, that's let's wisdom. Go, let's go. Look at wisdom. Wisdom has arrived. Hey. Tell us your name and what the answer to this question is. My name is Ivan. Hi, Ivan. Uh, oh, hi. Oh, cool, cool. Um, it's the bridge. Mm -hmm. Part one, correct? Uh, so the, 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 uh -huh. the, segment. the segment. What's the prayer segment called? Um, throne room. Woo! Give him a clap. Oh, hey. That's it. Congratulations, Ivan. Absolutely. You get to win yourself a coupon from the Neighborhood Connect Cafe. Absolutely. Pass by the cafe and you can have something to drink. Meanwhile, yes, I know that those, they are known for so many things, but yeah. they are milkshakes. Mm. It's not that I'm telling you what to buy, but their milkshakes are dope. So, yeah. yeah. Second so, question. I, I know some, in some things we've been giving away answers before we ask the questions. But, yeah. here's another question. In what year did power sex money start? Let's go. In what Great. year did power sex this money is such start? such a simple question. It's a very friends. simple one. We such confirmed the answer question. before we came here. In what year did Power Sex Money start? Let's see. Memory, you know, memory. Have you, you have to come up on stage. You have to come up on stage if you're sure of the answer. Let's go. We're waiting for you. Mm -hmm. In what year did Power Sex Money start? No one wants to try. No one wants to guess. Somebody? Anybody? Or is the coffee going to be for me? Anybody? Please come guess. <laughs> In what year did Power Sex Money start? Please tell us your name and then tell us what you think the answer is. Okay, mm, Lydia is my name. Hi, Draz. 2017. Uh, so you see, this is what I was saying. I'm not going to know how to tell people to walk back. Uh, <laughs> when they are wrong. Let's give her a clap because she dared. And because of Lydia, because of Lydia, someone else is going to get the coupon. If you already have one, you're not getting another one. Yeah. So in what year did... No, we please. want to see your cool outfit. We, we gotta please. see you. First of all, you look so nice. Let's <laughs> give her a round of applause as well. <laughs> this one looks Hi like everyone. you. She said My the name is Anita and PSM started in 2018. Let's give her a hand. <laughs> but I want to give my coupon to, I've forgotten her name, the one who came before me. Brilliant. We love that. All about love. Thank you so much. <laughs> First of all, I know. This Can is... you just choose to give me your shoes, for example? Just say. We can swap I love them, after I this. Like, so, let's like, do one, it. one. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, for this question, for this next question, it's a church related question. So, we want to see how much you love your church. Yeah? Yeah? But no, the question is simple. What is the name, full name, of the cafe free, providing free. drinks in our lounge? Free. Outside. Free. Free coupon. Simple friends. Simple. Free coupon right now. This one we are giving away for free. We are not even. What is the name of the cafe providing yeah. drinks this in is the lounge? This is unconditional love. We literally here. just said it two minutes ago. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Front seat people are winning these things. Your name and the answer. Hi, my name is Diana. Hi, Diana. Uh, Connect Neighborhood Cafe. Say that again. Connect Neighborhood Cafe. How do we deal with this matter? So, I'm wondering whether to be petty um, or, or kind. Let's, can, can we allow our deacons and bishops to make the decision for us? Deacons and bishops, you okay, have the you best have answer. answer. Your name? Your Sheila name? Akanku, Hi, Sheila. The answer is Neighborhood Connect Cafe. <laughs> it was as simple as that. Just a swap on the words and somebody won that one. Now, Jaraz. Yes, Paula. The next thing. In fact, for this one, let's just have silence for a minute. Just for a minute. I need you to take in the goodness of God in the land of the living yeah. that we are about to showcase yeah. this minute right this now. This question mm -hmm. is the winning question with a so, winning gift. Right. So for the next 
question. You're not just winning a neighborhood connect cafe voucher. It's super simple. It's though. super simple, but also super close to my heart. I'm going to cry if You're no one cry. gets it. All right, let yeah. me help you ask the question. Please. But I'd like to advise that once again, please come up on the stage, share your name. Let me just say what they're winning first. I think that will give away the answer. That will give away the answer. Mm. Yeah? Okay. Let's first <laughs> ask the question. Just know you're winning something different. All right. So. Mm -hmm. so here's your last question for this evening. Which of these Power FM hosts is also a published author? Which of these Power hosts is also That's a the published energy. That's author? That's the energy I'm looking and for. And here are your options. You see? DJ Hush mm -hmm. and B. Che Macelli. Sis, you need to say that again. You need DJ Hash and at least not just walked on the stage a minute, to answer this question. Just a minute. Just a minute. Yes, Paula. Because we are dope, yep. we want to give you another. You have an opportunity yeah, to think about it again. And if it's not the one you have, it's okay. No yeah. shame. Again, which of these Power, Power FM, FM hosts mm -hmm. is also a published author? And we your have options, options are DJ Hash mm -hmm. and Che Macelli. What's the correct answer? Your name and the correct answer. My name is Mark. It's Che Macelli. Give him a hand. Super simple. So Mark, and thank you so much. Also, may I just say yep. that Mark is one of the most dedicated Power listeners. FM listeners yeah. ever. Yeah. yeah. He listens to every show, every... I don't know how you do it. He texts <laughs> and requests. Yes. And it's always good to know someone is listening because sometimes mm -hmm. you're like talking to a microphone and you don't know who's on the other side and it's always nice see, when see. They <laughs> they'll give us therapy they'll, it's, they'll give us therapy yeah. okay it's fine but anyway mark you're not just winning a neighborhood connect cafe voucher you are winning that but you're also winning a book the book absolutely thank you so much for your dedication thank you very much so before we get into the gist of this evening we want to remind you that the hashtag that we're using is Power Sex Money with a capital P, a capital S, and a capital M. And this is where you have real people with real stories and real solutions. Let's worship together. How are you doing today? Would you rise up on your feet? Just get up and make some noise in this house. Give a big clap. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. Come on. Clap your hands like this. Come on. Hey. hey, hey, hey. Come on. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Justified, you shook me out of my feet. You took the limits off. Now that your presence is I believe it. I believe it. Whom the sun sets free is free in me. Whom the sun sets free is free in me. Yeah. You've already won the victory. You've already. Hey, 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 
touch the world But it couldn't feel me Man's empty praise and treasures of fame are never enough Then you came along And put me back together
sound. Come on, clap your hands and celebrate Jesus tonight. Indeed. Come on, let's pray together, shall we? Jesus, you are the only one who can turn graves into gardens. You are the only one who can turn seas into highways. You are the only one who can make a way where there seems to be no way. You're the only one who can give beauty for ashes. Even when we are ridden out, Lord, even when it seems like we've lost the battle, even when it seems like we're between a rock and a hard place, you are the one who shows up. You are the one who makes a difference. You are the fourth one in the fire. You are present and you are the only one, the only one who can turn what the enemy meant for evil into good. That is why we lift up our hands. And that is why we sing and that is why we clap. That is why we shout the way we do because we have a reason to celebrate. You are our reason to celebrate. We give you glory and we give you honor. Come on in Jesus' name. Shout amen and amen and amen to our God. Come on one more time. Will you lift up a hand of praise to Jesus? He is worthy of our praise. Amen, 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 amen. Will you help me turn to three people around you? High five them. Tell them to wel welcome to Power Sex Money today. Welcome to Power Sex Money. Welcome to Power Sex Money. And having done that, you may be seated. You may be seated right where you are. For those of you who are in the room, I also know that we have friends joining us online. Come on, will you clap your hands and welcome everyone that's joining us online on the app as well as on YouTube. Welcome every single one of you. We're so thrilled that on a Friday night like this, you would join in for what I believe is going to be a really significant evening for all of us together. The thing I love about past sex money is this, is that we get to talk about life and we get to host real people who have a great story that will help you find solutions to life. Really excited about what we are going to hear this evening. And I just want to encourage you to be a part of the conversation. So on all our social media platforms, make sure you use the hashtag power sex money. We want to make sure that today the city of Kampala, the nations of the world hear the message that is coming from this house and I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Well, without spending any more time, I want to take this opportunity to welcome a man that I love, a man that I respect and honor. He's a great pastor, he's a great father, he's a great brother, he's a great friend. Will you put your hands together for our host tonight, Pastor Eddie Mwesiche, as he hosts us today on Power Sex Money. Thank you, Brian. You're a good man. Come on, let's appreciate Pastor Brian tonight. Amazing. And uh, I mean, strange things happen here at Pass X Money. I've never worn anything pink in my life until today. And so please take all the selfies. Oh, a selfie is supposed to be taken by me. All right, we are old people, all right. So I'm going to sit down. And are you looking forward to tonight? Yeah. Come on, turn to your neighbor. Tell them, get your phone. Get your phone. Come on, tell your neighbor, get your, get your phone. If it's smart, if you have some data, go to YouTube. I know Facebook is limited access by a few. Then go to Watoro Church, Uganda. Find that page. We are live on Watoro Church, Uganda. There is a, a clickable something called share. All right, click it. And then go to your WhatsApp. All Ugandans have WhatsApp. Now, if you're online... All right, go to whatever social media platform, share that link, let people be a part of PSM tonight because the story that's going to be shared tonight, I believe, is an incredible story. And you don't want your friend to miss out. And so please share, share, share until you cannot share no more. Now, if your neighbor is not sharing, look at them, find, tell them, what's up, man? What's up? What's up? What's up? Or you can send some kamani, like we say in Uganda, some kamani, right? Or some data, or data. You know, some of us call it data, but it costs the same thing. If you call it data or data, it's all the same, all right? All right, welcome to Pass X Money, and Pastor Brian did a great introduction where we get to talk to real people with real stories. You know, I love stories. 
Because there's something powerful in a story. You know why stories are powerful? Stories are powerful because they represent who we are. When somebody shares their story, we get to see ourselves. And that is why we like those movies that depict real life. Because when you see people in the struggle, you see yourself in the struggle. And you know what you do? You love it because it relates to you. And so tonight, we are not in a movie. This is real stuff. No action, no acted stuff, real stuff. There is something so powerful when God redeems your story. And so tonight, I would like you to put your hands together and welcome to the stage, Che Macheli. Che. Come on, put your hands together. Please be seated. And um, Che Macheli, Che, you will let us know what that means, but sounds cool. Um, absolutely. Um, you know how, uh, oh, by the way, you guys all look lovely tonight. Thank you so much for turning out. Um, to, to, for some reason, Ugandan schools are obsessed with referring to children by their surnames. And uh, my last name, Macheli, is actually my father's name. To this day, nobody knows how to pronounce it. He himself, my father. And so um, when I was in P1, one of my friends was trying to uh, pronounce Macheli, Macheli, and got frustrated and just shouted across the playground, Che! To this day, it's stuck. Very few people know that my government name is Rebecca Macheli. People know me as Che Macheli, so Che it is. <laughs> so everybody say Che! Right. All these guys love you. <laughs> One more time, say Che! <laughs> now, in my language... <laughs> wow, okay. Che, che ku. Wow. I think it's only Brian who knows that means. It means keep quiet. Okay. So tonight you're not going to keep quiet, all right? Right. <laughs> Wonderful. So it's good to have you here today. And um, a few, uh, must have been a couple of, uh, must have been during the lockdown. Mm -hmm. One of those days I was at Power FM and Ronnie Habasa, who hosts PSM a lot, just said, you know what? You need to hear Che's story because I've met you. You are presenting in the yes. Power FM studios. And so you need to hear her story, an amazing story. And I said, you know, one day I'm going to listen to that story. And uh, I didn't know it was going to show up in a book. And right. you know what? The things that I've failed to do, you have done. Can, can we appreciate Che for writing a book, you know? <laughs> and as you clap for her, please pray for me so I can write a book. You know, some of us... <laughs> We have ideas, but putting them down is not very easy. Right. But you know what? The book really captures things that have happened in your life. So, yes. first and foremost, who is Che? Who are you? Wow. Um, che is a woman after God's heart. Um, che is a lover of life. I love life, you know. Um, I, love, I love people. I love to talk. I love to create. I'm a creative um, I like to read, I like to write, I just like to create stuff. In my free time, I create. And it's, it's actually something that I actually struggle with because my mind is never quiet. That's, that's the thing. I'm always thinking about something. Even in studio, ask Eki and Roni. They'll be like, Che, we are coming on. And my mind will be like, okay, so now this angle we get for today, yeah, the kickstart. I haven't even heard that we are coming back on. So it's just, yeah, I'm, I'm really a, a busy mind. And I love that. I mean, God used uh, it for good now. And I'm very grateful for that. So, yeah, that's basically Che. I am a radio presenter at 104.1 Power FM. And that's Che. That's Che. Yeah. Wonderful. She gets to present, gets to write, gets to create. But I, I love what you said at the beginning. You are a girl after God's heart. Right. And that's the most important thing, your identity. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're not lost into the things that we do. Right. It's your first being before you are a doing. Yeah. And that is powerful. Now, the reason you're sitting here today is because you have a powerful story. And I believe that, um, you know, Somebody needs to hear this story. Yeah. And I'm grateful that you've captured it in the book. And so tonight we get to hear a little bit of a summary of what, you, uh, what God has done in your life. But right. if you can just take us back, what is your story? My story began as a little girl. I grew up in somewhere in Entebbe, um, but later moved on to Kampala. Uh, I studied, uh, did my primary school, my secondary school. I was a good kid. I loved to read, to write. Getting me away from the library was a problem. Che, they've come for you. Uh, they've been looking for Che. Che's in the library. Hmm, my goodness. They once locked me in the school library, actually. It was, yeah, it was a, a movie. But, uh, uh, yeah, I was, I was, still am, a brilliant person ever since my childhood. And I've always loved 
reading and writing. And that's one thing that I'm grateful to my father for, that even as soon as I began to walk, he taught me how to write, he taught me how to read. And I'm very great, grateful to him for that. Um, I grew up in a family of, of six children, three boys, three girls. One is late, uh, my eldest brother. And yeah, I grew up, uh, did my primary school, went to secondary school. Um, I grew up in an interesting household. My father was a, a busy man. He, was a, he is now a retired pilot. My mother was a businesswoman. So my father was rarely at home. So he was stopped being posted in Uganda and then he moved to Kenya. So in the house, it was just me, my elder brother. The other siblings left and went to the States and the UK. So it was just me and the brother who follows me. We were the youngest kids. The rest were all grown up. So my dad was always away from home. We'd be home with mom. And it really, that was just what the house was, you know. So down along the road in 2005, when I was 14, uh, mom passed away. And it was so sad because I wasn't around when it happened. She had dropped me at the airport to go represent the country at a, an international conference for cricket. I used to play cricket as a sporty child, basketball, cricket, tennis, everything. I even tried rugby, but now I get shape. But uh, um, yeah, I know, yeah. But uh, yeah, she dropped me at the airport and uh, you know, I went to Zambia for the conference. When I came back, I landed down, uh, came to arrivals and I found my two aunts standing there and I was like, where's mom? But you know, I didn't think much about it. But when we got home, uh, that's when they began to tell me, Rebecca, you need to be strong. Uh, mom fell sick over the weekend, she, uh, you, she passed away. And I'm like, what are you guys talking about? And that's when we arrive at the gate and there's the, the, the high school bus, the bus of the high school I used to go to and you know, uh, tents and all these cars. And then it hit me, I was like, wow, mom is actually gone. Ma mom passed from liver cirrhosis. Uh, she struggled with alcohol very much. And uh, I grew up seeing the effects of alcohol dependence, not necessarily abuse, but alcohol dependence. I did grow up seeing it, but the gravity of it did not hit me, because I was a child as I saw it. So asking questions like, why would a person act this way or that, I, I will never find out. But um, yeah, mom passed and really we were left with dad. Dad is a logic, he's a man who read books, you understand? If you're asking him, he, the answer is yes, the answer is no. Anything else is from the devil. It is yes, it is no. Uh, what would you like for tea? I want tea. I don't want but a caramel with, well, he doesn't have that banter, you understand? So, yeah, so um, really he didn't know what to do with us. He just went on being a father, being a man. He went back to Nairobi to work. My brother and I went back to school. So in the house, it was just my brother, myself, and the housemaid, really. So my brother is literally a carbon copy of his father, speaks when spoken to, loves his books, technology. You know, his social life is zero. And I was the exact copy of my mother extrovert, larger than life. Mom always had parties, always wanted to be around people. So if you know my first name, Rebecca, the name Rebecca in Hebrew means to bind. So I bring people together. And that's something that actually reflected in my life much later on. And you know, um, in 2006, I was in my S4 VAC, and that was when I was introduced to alcohol. Um, I was a good kid. I, I never used to do, you know how you hear those stories where people saying, we used to jump in high school, Simanya, what? Me, how do you even tell me that KB? Do you understand? Like, how are you even proud saying that? Right. So I really didn't know much about that kind of lifestyle. So I had a very good friend in high school um, of the opposite sex. And one night, there's a telecom company that had those discounts of uh, Simanya, you talk for one shilling per second all night, you're teenagers, you're lying to yourselves from 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. You're on phone. After five hours, you've spent number one five. Oh, my God. But uh, yeah, so, so, yeah, so um, he called me up one night and said, you know, on phone, and then it's like 11.45. And then he just blurted it out. He was like, Chair, I want to take you to a certain club, a popular, renowned club. And I said, excuse me, you heathen. How dare you speak to me like that? Is that how you think of me? But in like 30 seconds, he convinced me, and I was like, okay, fine. I said, how are we going? He said, I'm going to come pick you up. I said, okay. He came, it was, a, I remember very well, dark green short chassis, came outside the gate. I don't think even my brother knew I had left the house. He was in his room, I think, fixing something at 11 in the night. But um, uh, the car picks me up, we go uh, to the club, hang out. I mean, he was, we are teenagers, but he was navigating, the, he, could, he could navigate the place blind, I think. Mm. You know, he knew the, waitress, the waitresses knew him by name, he took me to the counter, he said, take care of her. 
And you know the funny thing? This is one thing that I remember. The first time I ever went out in my life, the waitress asked me, what would you like to drink? I kid you not, I asked them for splash mango. I kid you not. The lady laughed. She laughed. She called my friend and she said, I think she was telling him like, man, who's this? She needs to be in class. What? May I told him, I don't drink your ugly alcohol and all this stuff. Then he said, no, he tried to explain to me there's beers and there's gins, but all those things did appeal to me because I saw what they did growing up. You know, I, I wasn't that kind. So there was a type of brand that came out, crazy marketing campaign. They had branded fridges, if you know, you know, but uh, yeah, it looked so good. It stood out in the club. I said, I want what that is. It looks like soda. It looks sweet. You know, I have a very sweet tongue. I get it from my father. Uh, I'm like a bee. So I was like, I want that. It looks sweet. They gave me the first three. They were so sweet. They went down. The first three bottles I took went down in less than seven minutes. Because it was really sweet. And I couldn't, I didn't know what intoxication felt like. So I couldn't feel it creeping up on me. I didn't know what it felt like. Me, I just thought that the music was just was sounding better. You can't, <laughs> you really can't tell what intoxication is until after you've experienced it and the effects that it presents to you. So I, you guys, I danced. I danced in this corner, the other corner, I danced. No, but I took about like nine bottles that night. And, ooh, that's the beginning. It's really nothing. But uh, that was the beginning. I went back home. Um, I, I literally, my friend dropped me home. I walked into the house. I don't remember walking into the house. All I know is I woke up. I looked at the ceiling, I looked down, all my clothes were on, even my shoes. Like literally, I just fell on the bed like, bah! As soon as my eyes opened, it was midday. I got my phone and the first thing I, I called my friend and the first thing I told him is, where are we today? Wow. That was the beginning of what should have been the end. Wow. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. So I'm just quickly moving forward. Um, I, I, I go to my A-levels now. I went to a different school, much more liberal than the traditional school that I was in. Very conservative, you know, girls can keep their hair long and relaxed, we wear jeans. Um, the, the opposite sexes can mix very liberally. Right. Dances would start from 8 p.m., they end at 5, 5 a.m. And, you know, alcohol was allowed in the dances. I became a prefect, so I really had leeway to leave school whenever I wanted and all that. So I was constantly partying, what I can say. And as I did that, um, because I really had the freedom to leave home whenever, whenever I wanted. So I really built tolerance for alcohol in a very short time. By the time I got to university, I was a seasoned, I was a first year chick seated with PhD and master's students and they would just look at me like as this anomaly. They're like, how does a young girl drink like this? You understand? But for me, I thought it was cool. Right. You know, that it was like a form of reverence, like right. that's gonna make you cool. And everyone wanted to be around you because people wanted to be around you, you know. And uh, uh, we went on, we went on. So after first year, first sem, I go to second semester. And second semester, I didn't pay my tuition. I, what we say, drank the money. Yes. It was a lot of money. In like two weeks, it was gone. I housed like the entire university in like two weeks. But uh, I went through the semester. The entire semester was just drinking. Like you wake up, hangover. Where is the, okay, we drink all night. Like, like that was it. You're either unconscious or you're drunk. That was it. So towards the time for exams, because I literally never went to class. I, I had retake upon retake upon retake, you know. So I, I um, towards exams, that's when I, as what happened to the prodigal son, came to my senses. And I said, what am I going to tell my father? And so I called him and I told him, you know what, I don't like the course that I'm doing in this university. Uh, I don't think it's going to be good for my future. I had to lie. I had to come up with something. So I, I, uh, uh, he told me, "Ah, no, you come home, and then we talk. We talk it through." We, I came home. He talked it through, and I got. Uh, I applied into another university for another course, bachelor's of being around, but uh, yeah, BBA. <laughs> but uh, I got admitted, and I went to this university. Now, this university is a very renowned Christian university. In the university I was in previously, it is a university along Masaka Road. If you know it, you know it. Ah, uh -huh. I like that laughter because you know, you now have perspective, yes. And coming from that place to this Christian university was like culture shock, you know. I'm someone who I lived by cigarettes, I lived by marijuana, I lived by, by alcohol, you know, every day. But now this is a Christian university. Even mentioning the word cigarette is like you've murdered the Pope. You get what I, what I mean. 
And so it was just so strange that dress code was just, so, it, it was just such a constraining experience. And I said, I, I, I just went through first sem, but it wasn't doing it for me. I said, I have to find a way to get out because first years have to be in a hole, yeah? And you're constantly supervised. I said, I have to get out of this. So I had a letter forged. Uh, uh, they, they were supposed to get a, a letter from the vice chancellor to be exempted or whatever. I had a letter forged by a friend from a popular place down there. Uh, yeah, so we went on. Uh, I got my letter and then I got a hostel. Now, in second sem, history repeated itself. Chewed my tuition. I was in this university for three years. But if you go to that university now and ask for Rebecca Machedi's transcript from my year, you'll only have results of first year, first sem but I was there for three years. I would just go, pay hostel, and drink and party. That was it. And eventually, even as time went on, even as time went on, I really, I really tried, to, the, the fact is I tried to study. I did. I would go to the bar, party till like, um, I won't even say five. We would see the sunrise and sit there and watch sunrise. We would leave the bar at 10 a.m. I'm not even going to try and yeah, and this is a normal thing in Kampala here, Pastor Eddie, of leaving the bar in. Yeah, it's, very, it's, a very norm, it's very normal in Kampala. Mm, 10 is even early, actually, in some places. So, uh, yeah, of course, I, I had, uh, now I was in first year, but now, you know, since I was in first year, this side, my friends who, all, my year mates were now in second year, I was in first year. So now I'm the first year that the second years want to hang around, you know. So they would always take me out, invite me to their hostels. I was always the first year who was at the second years, house parties and stuff like that. And of course, I thought this was what? Cool. So, you know, drinking, smoking. I was now literally in the environment that I wanted to be. I could drink and smoke any time that I wanted. Um, somewhere along the way in second, in it, what, what, what should have been second year, I, I got pregnant. And, you know, I went, I did the test, and it didn't even, at this point, I was so, I think I was aware of how I had messed up, that now I'm on second chance, but now I've ruined second chance. I said, sis, we've already reached here, let's just real ruin it until the end. So I realized that I'm pregnant, and uh, the doctor actually advised me. She told me, Che, you know what, you should not, uh, you know, you should just consider having the child. Um, and it, it, I think it had, it was like four weeks, I think, or something like that. And then I told, uh, I told her, no, like there's no, there was, there was no space for debate. Like I, I hear you and all your concerns, there's no space for debate. So I had it terminated. Mm -hmm. I had it terminated. Um, I went back to school, like, you know, everything is normal. I went, you know, after the, the procedure, you're supposed to stay back and, you know, stay off alcohol because you risk infection. I had no time for that KB. I really went straight to the bar that, that day, that one. So I didn't even take my antibacterials, which actually affected me later because I did get infected in, in my fetus area. Uh, the fetus. The, the womb area, yes. I go. <laughs> yeah, so um, I moved on with life. I moved on with life. Um, but now I think, you know, there's a way, there's a way really you can tell a, a university student who's in third year. Hmm? I was not a university student in third year. A university student in third year, first of all, is preparing for their thesis. They are going to libraries, doing research, things like that. Che was leaving the house at 4 p.m., coming back at 7 a.m. every day. So I think my father said, mm, there's a problem here. Went to the university, he came home. One day I was leaving the house in the afternoon. Ready, I think I was going to Kabbalagala or something to, to like drink and party. And the car comes in and he tells me, I want to speak to you. And then he takes me to his room and he didn't even say much, just pulled out the sheet of paper. And there was my, you know, blank, as in you can you see the name up there, first year, basic computing, accounting, a, 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 anything after that, blank, up to the third year. And you know, my father, a man of few words, it really, really broke my heart because the look in his eye, this was a man who gave us everything that we ever wanted. And you know, he was just so heartbroken. And he just told me, you know, go to your room and think about what you've done. And you know, I went to my room and it hurt me so much I couldn't deal with myself in that moment. I just got up, left the house. I was away for about seven days. I went to a friend's house. And because I did not want to confront that issue, I did not know what to tell my father. I really didn't, to be honest. And so I was away from the house for seven days. I slept at my friend's house. We were drinking and partying daily. 
day and night. Yeah. At night we are in the bad day we are in the house, but drinking, drinking is the common factor here and smoking. So after seven days, you know, as the sun sets, as the sun rises, the sun sets, everything comes to an end. Even my friend said, ah, che, go home after seven days, you know. So eventually I had to face it. So I came home and my father asked me, what should I do for you? Because I've really run out of options. What should I do for you? So somewhere, somehow, I found myself in an Italian convent in Nairobi. Very harrowing experience for someone who has lived a liberal life. Very, it was a harrowing experience. This was culture shock of the highest order. Catholics live a, spe a premiumly unique <laughs> life, you guys. And it was basically where under privilege, it was like a it was a, okay, I, to this day I'm trying to comprehend what that institution was. It was run by Italian fathers whom we never saw. We would just see their robes moving. Woo, 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 woo. <laughs> but I, I kid you not, there were many, there were like, I think 10, but we ne no one ever saw their faces. So it's an institution, it's a Catholic institution, like a convent, but it's, like the, it's a school where they teach underprivileged girls. Um, things like food, they call it, what are those courses? Food production, like catering and that stuff. So it's, a, it's like a vocational institute in a fancy Italian mansion. I can, yeah. But now the girls, we would wear these terrible uniforms, you know, <laughs> The guy's uniform is nice. This thing was, uh, yeah, I, I went there, yes. <laughs> no, but it, it was just a different life. You wake up at 4 a.m., you go to sleep at 11 p.m. It was hard labor from when you wake up. You wake up, you're either posted in the laundry, where Italian fathers wear heavy, with these robes, they wear, how does one person wear all that stuff? So they, they post you in either the laundry or like the, the food section. They asked me, Chair, where do you want to be posted? Ah, I said, put me near food, please, because that laundry doesn't look friendly. So, you know, it was just an interesting life. Like, you wake up, you're tired, you haven't slept much, and now my sleep was also being disturbed because now I have absolutely no access to cigarettes and alcohol. I was literally, I was having withdrawals at night. And everybody had their own room, so that was the bit I would look forward to, the privacy. But in my room, I was like, I need to get out of here. I was in a place where people were calling me Rebecca. I said, Banang. Every time someone said Rebecca, I said, you know, it would hit me that, Che, you're not home. Like, this is a different space. So one day, I said, enough is enough. Let me just summarize it. I found a way to sneak cigarettes into the convent. So I think they were cleaning my room one day. You guys, we thought of someone had, had found, wow, what? We just had a scream, what? So all of us are in that, you know, I had even forgotten that I had cigarettes in the room. So, you know, all of us run in our uniforms, right? we're like, what has happened? <laughs> Till this woman comes out saying, she knows she's holding and she's screaming in Swahili. She's in Kiswahili, I said, I'm finished, today's the day. So the, the head sister, you know, it, they were so trauma. It's like it had, they had never experienced something like that. So <laughs> the head nun calls... My, 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 my father's wife, my mother, now, and tells her, you know what, this child, yeah, you, you take her to Uganda because really you can find something for her to do. She really tried to be politically correct. They were so traumatized cigarettes in the convent. So uh, they put me on a bus because now even she didn't know what to do for me in Nairobi. She, she asked me, you know what, this one now is in your hands. I don't know what you're going to do with your life. Do you want to go back to Kampala? Me, in my mind, I'm like, we go and party. I said, I'm ready. I, I went to my room, packed my things, and the next day I was on a bus back to Kampala. I came back to Kampala, and now it was, that's when reality hit. I walk into the house. My, you know, my father is very distant from me because he doesn't even, where do you start? He says, I don't know what I'm going to do for you, you know. So there I am. Now I, I, I start thinking that I'm, I'm very smart. You know, I'm going to make it in Kampala. I start looking for places. Now, it just so happened by God's grace. Um, that's the time when Facebook was coming up as a major communications medium and stuff like that. So um, I used to like writing, and that's how I would get by at the convent uh, the other side. I would write on my Facebook, you know, funny things that happened at the convent, but I would turn the story another way so people could, it, it, to like change characters and scenarios. But the things that would happen at the convent were literally funny. So people would enjoy uh, the content. And so a friend of mine hit me up and told me, hey, Che, there's a, an advertising agency that's looking for a senior copywriter. I said, what's that? They said, somebody who's in charge of checking the copy of companies uh, on Facebook, Twitter, and all that. I said, 
send my number. We'll learn on the job. Uh, I was invited for an interview. I got the interview. Uh, they asked for some of my sample writing. I had written some articles for a magazine based in the UK when I was in the university. So they liked uh, the work and they said, hey, you can start immediately. Mm -hmm. My first job was earning a lot of money, about 1.3 M. And money in the hands of a fool is a very dangerous thing. I would get paid that money and in 48 hours I would be broke. Can you, you know, I look back at that man and I'm like, but she, you know, and, and of course you have to, because dad is not giving me money, I have to look after myself. I would drink this money literally in 48 hours and then we start looking at how is the next month going to go. I had to stake the company's, the company gave me a phone to use. I had to stake it at a money lenders every month. Very good friend of mine. I, I hope he's watching. Shout out. Really, you helped me so much. But uh, yeah, um, I staked the phone and, you know, that's how I, you know, it was really bondage. You, you earn money, you pay it back. That, so you, re you really don't have money. So as time went on, my, it, it's, the over the, the happiness started to reflect in my work. I used to I used to do, I used to do very excellent work, and so my boss calls me to her office one day and she says, "Che, I got a call from a client that you reported to the status meeting when you were smelling like a distillery. Is everything okay?" So I tried to of course say, mm, "No, maybe that was just a day when you know I had had too much that night." She said, mm -mm, "Even your workmates are complaining. You come to work smelling like cigarettes. You're walking in into work at 10 a.m." You know, your, your, even your copy, like your work is, is slacking. You used to do very stellar work, but now, you know. And so for me, I felt like that was an attack on me. I felt like it was an attack. I felt like, you know, people didn't understand. Because even at home, I was getting fire of why are you partying? You know, I, I would go home when, when people are asleep. I would make sure I head home like at midnight when people are asleep. I leave before people wake up. You know, I didn't want any of this nonsense of why are you drinking, why are you partying. I was like, you know, just let me live my life. Okay, I've found my job, let me party. Um, as time went on, time went on, I woke up one day and decided not to go back to work. It was like a bout of depression. I would just wake up and fall in a bout of sadness, and I wouldn't go to work. I would miss work for like three days, then I go for the for work at a day, and then someone asked me, Che, why didn't you come to work? I have no explanation. You know, I'm just like, ah, I wasn't feeling well. They're like, do you have a doctor's note? I'm like, no, I don't. You know, things like that. So eventually, I decided to just not wake up and go to work. I literally, I fired myself from that job. No resignation, no nothing. I just didn't wake up to go to work. And so they started calling me up. Um, my father comes and asks me, Yunga, you're not going to work. I told him, I asked for leave. He says, hey, after one week, two weeks, three weeks, one month, he says, but this leave, what's up? Ah, I told him, I, I asked for extended leave. I'm not well. I needed a break. What? I'm to recalibrate my mind. So I think he understood. Eventually, he just stopped asking. But the, it was really a strained conversation in the house. Very strained. And so, first of all, this guy who I had given the, the phone, the money, the money lender, I had no money to pay him. Because if you don't go to work, they don't pay. I had no money to pay him. The, the, the company phone stayed with him. I don't know if he still has it to this day. It's eight years later. I don't know if he still has it. Uh, but, uh, of course, sitting there, life became hard. I had no source of money. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying not... I would keep myself in my room because I didn't want to walk out. I didn't want people to ask me questions. I'd keep myself in my room when, when people are, you know, not moving around the house. I would sneak out, go party, come back the next day, sleep the whole day, then go out party daily. That's what it was. Um, by God's grace, I found another job. Uh, still in the same line, advertising and communications. Very good pay. Um, I was put in charge of because they had seen the work that I had done at the other agency. That's how the advertising uh, world works. You know, you're just based on the projects that you've worked on. I get to this new agency. Things are going well. First, you know, probation, the probation time, beautiful. I said, Che, yeah, this is good work. The client is pleased. As soon as I was given permanent contract, one month, didn't even take long, one month. As, long as, as soon as the money came, boy, pa, one month like this, problems. I started coming to work when I wanted. I would wake up like at 2 p.m. and then I say, oh, what do I go to work? Oh, what do I not? Oh, do I just go and show face? You know, there's that, oh, what, go and show face and say you are trying to do some things to look for content or oh, what, you know. You know, it just became strange. 
then eventually uh, <laughs> something interesting uh, happened. One night I was coming home. At this time, my father, I think, had gotten tired of complaining about my drinking and partying. So one night I went out to party. <laughs> and I had no money on me to bring me back home. So I called my border guy who was at our stage at home. I told him, Paulo, come and pick me up. I'm at such and such a place. He said, okay. Paulo picked me up. Rode the border. Woo, back home. So we reached home and we find the padlock was inside, not outside. Basically, this was a sign saying, Daioje wa suzi. I said, hmm, people think they are sharp. Okay. First of all, I'm intoxicated, drunk. I tell Paulo, Paulo, book a fence and help me open from inside. Said he, tewaliuzi. <laughs> Paulo jumped. Now, we had an Ascari called Samson. Samson passed in 2016. But uh, now this, this scenario I'm talking about is 2015. So Paulo jumps. Now we had an Ascari called Samson. God rest his soul. Um, Samson was a drunkard. This guy had served our family from the 70s, since before I was born. Now, this guy would walk from like, he would walk to places. He would walk to Smanya Soya, Smanya Munyonyo, Smanya Wea, looking for alcohol. And then he was coming to guard the home. And anyway, we were really guarded by God's grace because Samson was a special individual. Paulo jumps the fence. Now, me, I even thought Samson was sleeping, that he couldn't hear. Because I really knocked. I knocked at that gate for a significant amount of time, but Samson hadn't opened. I told Paulo, jump. Ah. As Paulo is opening the gate, Samson staggered out of his kayumba. This man is a security guard for him. He's a, he's a man from, from Lira. Lira, Arua. Arua. He doesn't know guns. For him, he wields bow and arrow. He was drunk. This was one of the drunkest I had ever seen Samson. Samson is holding a bow and arrow and pointing it at Paulo. In that moment, Paulo could have actually died, in all honesty. And I'm on the other side of the gate, and my intoxication, all of it moved on the side. I said, Samson, don't kill the man. Samson is shouting in Kiswahili, when in Nani, I can kill you right now. Paulo is on his knees saying, Rebecca has told me. Everyone is shouting, like there is no, com there is no communication. Samson is shouting. Becky, there are two drunkards shouting and a scared man shouting. So we scream, and eventually, I think somewhere, somehow, Samson picks it up that it's me who's on the other side. Samson was ready to shoot his arrow and, and kill this guy. For real, for real, for real. So uh, he lowers the bow and arrow. I tell Samson, Samson, don't shoot him, please. Uh, just open the gate. Samson opens the gate. Paulo gets out. He even told me it's a free ton percent. <laughs> he told me, ton percent. Uh, he so goes. Don't pay me for our international speakers. Right. right? So it's a free ride tonight. Uh huh. So I, I really begged Samson. I told him, Samson, please, please. The the biggest thing you could do for me right now in this moment, don't tell Dad what has happened. Please. He said, ah, it's okay. So there were some menthol cigarettes that he used to like so much. He said, do you have my things? I said, I have them. I had a whole pack. They were expensive. Expensive. I told him, have. In fact, tomorrow I'll even bring you another one. Don't tell Dad. I went to sleep. At like 7 a.m., <laughs> my door woke me up. Bah! How dare you make a man jump over my face? In my hangover, I said, Samson. <laughs> and so, yeah, no, my father was... Growing up, if you ask anybody who knows my father, even us as the children, my father's never lifted a finger to hit anyone. He's never raised his voice. I can't imagine my father scream. That was the first time in life my father ever raised his voice. Ever. Me, I am the child who made my father raise his voice. And he was really disappointed, and he said a lot of things in that moment, um, very hurtful things, you know. And I, I actually knew that this is, this is the point, like this is the breaking point. He said a lot of things, you know. I was compared to my mother. Um, his things like, uh, I'll be called one day to identify your body in a morgue, in a ditch, things like that. No, he was really, really peeved. And he said, you need to find your own place. You can't stay here. The first words he said, I said, okay, he's annoyed. These last words I say, this man can't seriously be throwing me out of his house. Where am I going to go? I don't know any other place other than the four walls. And he closed uh, the door and he, he left. 
And so I sat there, I mean, I went about my day. And then like at lunchtime, the maid comes and asks me, so Che, uh, daddy has asked me if you're still home. I said, ah, this guy was serious. I said, okay. No, I really was hurt. I started to think, Che, where are we going to go? You understand? And so I packed a few things. I got like my academic papers, I got my passport. Um, and what else? Like a few clothes some photos of my mom, my photo album, packed them in a small suitcase. And I moved out of the house. And I started living in office where I used to work. I lived there for about a month. The only person who knew was uh, the steward, the lady who used to clean and stuff like that. Um, she actually noticed, she, she told me this later. She said, I noticed that you were sleeping in office, but I didn't want to say anything. So what happened is I asked her for the key of the office and I told her, hey, when you're leaving, help me with the key, I'm working late. Don't worry, you'll find it here. So when she would leave, I would lock the door and then stay in office or like I would lay stuff down and that's where I would sleep. But that's where I was living. So in the morning, I would set my alarm at like six. I would go to the, there were very nice bathrooms. I would shower, you know, freshen up. People find me at my desk, fresh, new clothes. Computer on focus. Yeah, I remember even the HR came one day and said, mm, Che, you want to be an employee of the year? I tell this year we might give out a car. I said, Great. <laughs> you know, so that was it for like a month. But even still, living in office, it was like it was close proximity to the happening area. So I was going out whenever I wanted. The Ascaris of the place became my friends. I was like bribing them with cigarettes to, you know, allow me to get in at, at odd hours of the night. But uh, it, it was really tough until one day the HR came and told me, Che, why are you living in office? Yeah, I really dried myself. I was like, me? Che? And no, 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 no. She said, no, Che, your stuff has been under your desk for a long time. This is a place that has CCTV surveillance, you know? She said, Che, sort your things out, otherwise the bosses are about to find out. So I had to hustle, hustle there. Uh, by God's grace, a friend of mine was uh, looking for a house. Uh, he had actually got a house, but he needed two housemates. And uh, he reached out to me and said, Che, I found a place here and here. I said, hey, no problem. How many months do you need? He said, told me the number of months. I said, it's okay. Uh, when the money came, at the, towards the end of the month, when the money came, I sent to him. I moved into the house. It was, it was okay for the first three, four months, surely. You know, you have a roof over your head. Now you're a bit organized. Your thoughts, you know, are a bit organized and stuff like that. But now still... It's like I was so, I was now freer to party. Can I say that? Yeah. But still, even it actually became worse during that time. Because even the people who used to come to the house, you know, when you're moving in with somebody, you don't know what they come with. So even the people who used to come to the house were bakubi. Really, I, I don't know how to say it, but you know, drunkards, they would smoke, some were even using other substances. Uh, but by God's grace for me, there are some substances that I did not venture into. Um, but yeah, eventually um, I got into a very serious bout of depression. It hit me in about October. And uh, at this time, what happened is I had gotten involved in event organization and management just to make a little extra money on the side. Um, I borrowed some money from a workmate. And I said, hey, no, don't worry, we're going to make an event. We put there the numbers. I said, it's going to make money. I'll have your money back at the end of the month. Not the end of the month, in like two weeks after we've you know, paid service providers and this and this and this. So I borrowed a lot of money from him. And he, we had our event. The event flap badly, 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 badly. Flopped. It badly. You have to add badly. Flopped is, you know, maybe there was a bit of recovery. We didn't even have a second edition. Um, so We shall let you get into a break soon, so if you okay. can just take it all the okay. way. Um, basically, uh, because of the situation, the tension with my workmate, because my workmate is now telling me, Che, where is my money? Where is my money? So I stopped going to work because I didn't want to meet my workmate. Um, so at this point, things were bad. I had no money. The end of the month came. I hadn't worked, so they didn't pay me. My bosses were asking me, where are you, where are you? I said, I, I, that one I also fired myself. No resignation, nothing. I just disappeared. But uh, I resolved things with my workmate. We settled things outside of office. Um, we settled things outside of office. But now I'm home, jobless again. 
the only way that I could, I had no money. I sold my phone that I had. Um, I started selling my jewelry. My housemates who were with me started asking me, but why aren't you going to work? Of course, I had to get them some lies there, but you can only lie for so long. And eventually, one month goes by, two months, three months, four months. After the fourth month, my housemate just told me, Che, get out. And now this time, I had no office to go to. I just carried a small bag. This was July 2016. And from July 2016 to Feb 7th, 2020, I was literally walking the streets of Kampala without a roof over my head. I would sleep at wherever, wherever, wherever my body would shut down from. So, you know, it beat a, a shopping mall along some road there. I've slept at traffic light stops, taxi stages, in bars, because that was my familiar territory. I'd sit in a bar just to survive the night till morning, especially like in the rainy season till morning. If morning came, uh, I would look for like a restaurant. I would kindly ask them, hi, can you please help me? Uh, I'd like to use your restroom. I would freshen up. My bag had a toothbrush, toothpaste, soap, sponge, basic necessities. Yeah, but eventually with time, it's, it started to show. I hid it for a very long time, being homeless and being, being helpless. I hid it for a very long time, but eventually it started to show. People would meet me and, you know, and say, mm, but she, I had someone, people, I had people asking, were you on drugs? Someone met you, but you didn't look, you know? And I'd be in a bar drinking with these people and like, what? Ah, no, maybe they met me on a bad day or whatever. But you know, I would sit in bars and sit with people at the end of the night, these guys are going to get in their cars and go home. Me, I'm going to walk at night, look for the nearest taxi stop, and put my bag down, cover myself with my jacket, and sleep. Wow. Yeah. At this moment, we're going to take a break. <laughs> <laughs> the good thing is, She's not on the streets anymore. And we're going to pick up that story after this break. Now we're going to give. And um, they, our ashes are going to wait on us. And uh, we're going to have some special music right here. The team is getting together. So if you're online, get ready with your giving, uh, your online Momo Pay. The instructions are going to be coming very soon. So as um, the ashes are passing the bags, give generously. Because let me tell you this. PSM costs money. <laughs> it's not free. So give so that we can continue telling stories that change people's lives. And the bags are going to pass. And as we give, uh, let's watch this video that shows us more giving instructions, how you can give online. And then after that, we shall do a song. And then we will be right back to continue with Che. Please take a moment to visit our website at watotochurch.com forward slash giving to find the most convenient giving option for you. You can also scan the QR code on your screen to open up our giving page. If you want to give via mobile money, you can find all the instructions for your specific career and respective codes. A secure option for those who wish to give through Visa or Mastercard debit or credit cards is also available through our partners at Stanbic Bank FlexiPay. Details of other giving options, including checks, bank transfer, or agent banking, can also be found on this page. Should you stay close to one of our 13 celebration points, we have secure gift boxes available for you to drop off your envelope if this is more convenient. For those of you watching from Juba, South Sudan, we have giving options especially for you through bank transfer and M. Gurush. Thank you for your faithfulness in helping to build God's kingdom. Faithful and I've been reckless at every bend. I filled everything together and watched it shatter. 
After toil and I have crumbled in the same breath I have wrestled and I have trembled to what surrender Just my heart had drifted, drifted home again Blinded as in the been desperate to find redemption and every time I turn around, Lord, you're still there. I was found before I was lost. I was yours before I was not. Grace to spare for all my mistakes. That part just wrecks me And I know I don't deserve this kind of love Somehow this kind of love is who you are It's a grace I could never add To be somebody you still You love me as you find me. 
about six. Growing up, I think, well, I've known Che for, for forever. Uh, we've been friends since P2. So I was about seven and she must have been about six. Growing up, I think she was more of like the fun one, the daring one, the one who would do the cheeky cheeky stuff the most. I met Che in uh, 2010 or early 2011 at university. Uh, by then, of course, you could tell she was a very intelligent, very intelligent girl, very creative, one of the best creatives I'd ever met. So before Power FM, me and Che used to hang. We had the same circle of friends, and uh, it's like a drink that put us together. Huh? I used to work in the bar industry. I would manage a few hangouts around at Cementi, and uh, she was a client, she was a customer. Yeah, she was a customer, and I uh, was a supplier. I thought she was just a normal drinks and catch up. I didn't know how serious it was until I think after campus, when I realized that it was more of a lifestyle rather than just weekend plot, like Friday, let's go out, let's hang out, what we'll dance and bichi. Then on Monday, everyone is back into their eh, normal work schedule. Like, it was constant for her. You know, you'd see her on a Monday and she would look like, <laughs> be like, what's the Like, eh? it was so weird. After some time, you start noticing maybe as you guys leave uh, the bar, everyone is going home. She stays around. Uh, after a week, she has no phone. She, yeah, you know. I think there's a time she bought a phone. Two days later, she has no phone. Someone gives her a phone. Three days later, she has no phone. So people started noticing there was something. There was something wrong. Che right now is a whole other person. Just like God says that we are a new creation, she's a whole new being. She's very organized. She's very focused on her work. She's chasing after God. She chases after excellence. Ah! You get out of program. Uh, she has no time for someone who's getting her off the path she's on. Right now, the chair we see is a good version of her, and we are yet to see a a much better version of her. Uh, she's actually now reaching out even to uh, different people who have gone through the same challenges with uh, mental health. We have people who we knew personally, who she also knows, who have been uh, going through drug addiction phases. Uh, and she has started an outreach program, try and reach them because these are people who she can relate to and who also uh, would be able to understand where she's speaking from because she has been through that same situation. <laughs> all right, all right. Welcome back from that uh, short break. I hope you're still here. And of course, that video tells us before and after. So before the break, we went through the... Oh, nice stuff happening here. Uh, the, we saw the, the, the bad, the ugly, and of course, when you see her sitting here today, she's not what she said she was. But I just want to take a couple of minutes just to know how she got off the street. How did you get off the street? You know, and um, um, you can take a second. Yeah, no, I need to, more than a second. More than a second. Let's get those tissues here. And uh, amazing. This is the story of God's grace, by the way. And that's why we celebrate this. That is why we celebrate this. And um, amazing. Amazing. Rebecca Chisachi Macelli. Oh, yeah. All the names are here on the book. Okay. Ah, but people are not loyal. Hey, Laura Grace, you don't tell me those words every day. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. how, from the streets to where you right. are today, if you can yeah. just briefly tell us what okay. happened. I'll really try to be quick because it's not, this is actually like the most crucial part of how it was like a springboard literally into God putting me in his own rehabilitation center. Mm. So just about at the end of 2019, my elder brother passed away. Uh, he passed away from alcohol complications. Mm. 
he had dealt with alcohol and drug uh, addiction as well. And so um, when I got the news, it, it really broke me because I felt like, you know, this happened to mom, it's happened to my elder brother, look at my life right now, you know. And so I went on a drinking spree. And during that week, uh, there's what we used to call Jack Bowers. If you watch the series 24, there's a main character called Jack Bauer. So a Jack Bauer is 24 hours of drinking without rest. So I would, we would do like three or four. You understand? Go like from Thursday to Sunday evening. I don't understand, but keep going. Okay. <laughs> Basically drinking for four days without rest, drinking night and day without sleeping. And basically, for me, this was now like a survival tactic. For me, drinking and hanging out in bars and being around people who are drinking was survival mode. I was in survival mode, not because I wanted to be there. You know, I had nowhere to live. You know, I was literally on the street. So one time as I was DJing, I'm a DJ, so it would help me um, survive as well. I would go to bars, and gun and bars really don't like paying DJs money. Uh, so they would say, we can pay you four beers and a plate of chips. And for me, that was good. I said, it's okay. And I would play. I would play music where I could. And so I was playing, and a man uh, walked up to me and said, you know, you are a very good DJ. You need to come. Uh, I'm opening a bar in Chanja. Can you come? I was so drunk. I had been drinking for three days straight. I told him, let's go. Just here, Chanja, we go. So he picks me up. We go to the bar. Um, we arrive. It was time for me to play my set. I was very, very drunk. The last thing I remember was seeing the machines. The next thing, my eyes were, I opened my eyes. I was in a small room. I didn't recognize the place. I had my familiar spots in Kampala, but I said, I don't know this place. I looked to my right, and there's a gentleman sleeping next to me. I didn't recognize him. I was in panic mode. First of all, I'm not even hungover. I'm still drunk, but, you know, the sun is rising, so I think some of the rays had hit me to wake me up. So I said, I don't know where I am. I need to leave. So I get up. Um, I, I head towards the door. I try to open it, and it's locked. So I'm in panic mode. I'm intoxicated. I don't know where I am. I'm in panic mode. So I start to bang the door. And then this gentleman stirs in his sleep. And then he, I, I remember hearing him. Uh, he asked and he said, what are you doing? Stop screaming. For me, I didn't want to know if this is friend, this is foe. I want to be out of the room. So I continue banging on the door. Next thing I know, his hand came around my neck and he began to choke me. So I'm losing consciousness. And... Literally, this guy choked me to a point of I could feel my life slipping away. But in that moment, all I could think about was nobody knows where I am. My brother doesn't know where I am. My father doesn't know where I am. And I remember my life literally. You know when they say your life flashes before your eyes when you're going to die? It happens. Like subconsciously, things you just... I started, I started picturing my mom. I started picturing people I had seen in a long time. Ridiculously in this moment. And then just by God's grace, I just heard his voice say, are you going to stop screaming right when I was losing consciousness? But I was so weak, I couldn't speak. So I just nodded and he let me go. He put me down on the mattress. And then he asked me, can I tell, do you know how you got here? And I said, I don't. And he started to narrate to me. He told me that the night before I was playing music in the bar where he was and I passed out while standing at the DJ booth. And one of the workers, the bartenders, got me and put me in a couch, and I was passed out. Him and his boys were on the table next door drinking, uh, on, the, on the next table drinking, and the worker came and he tapped one of them and said, do you know that I can sell you this chick for 20K? The guy sold me for 20K. <laughs> to, can you, I, by the way, I was, uh, yeah, 20,000 shillings. And he put me in his car and he told me, you know, I put you in my car. It's a pink one. You can even look outside the, the window. And I actually peeped and the, there was a white car. A white, it's a, a land, pink one is our land cruiser, whatever. It was parked there. And, you know, as we continue talking, he says, but me, I don't make a loss. I told him, what do you mean you don't make a loss? And he said that when we got home, somehow, somewhere, he found out I was in my period. And in my mind, I knew very well I was not supposed to be in my period. And truth, truthfully, he told me, you go to the bathroom and check yourself. I went to the bathroom, I checked myself, I was in my period. I kid you not, when I left that room, my period disappeared. And when I was leaving, this man told me, but you, if, when I'm speaking to you now, you don't sound like these women who hang around in that place. What are you doing in such a place like this? And I just told him I hit a bad stroke of luck in life. I don't want to explain the situation. At that time, I was rushing to another bar where I usually was playing music. It would, 
there are bars that open during the, uh, the night and there are bars that open in the morning as others are closed at night. So I was going to another one where I was playing. It opens at 5 a.m. So I was supposed to be already playing music. It was coming to 7 a.m. So I go to that bar. This is now Sunday, the fourth day of drinking with a little bit of rest. So I go and I play music. Now that afternoon, some friends um, suggest and say, let's go to a house party. And I said, okay. Had my drink in my hand. We walked. It was just almost on the same street. We walked down. And it was a, literally an apartment that somebody had turned into a bar. You know, they would invite their friends. They bought a fridge, put it there, put alcohol, and, you know. So I was a smoker, so I used to like sitting at the balcony. So there were so many people who were seated on the... I don't know. I think because of a furniture problem, people would sit on the ground. So I was literally climbing over people. Now, the furniture was pallet tables, but with glass tops. And the glass... Uh, the glass table, one of the glass tables was cracked at the corner. And as I was climbing, I was so drunk, I was at a point of euphoria. I was just literally laughing. You know, I was just so happy. Yeah. So as I'm moving, I'm climbing, I was just about to get to the door of the balcony. And I had someone shout, Che! Yeah, I thought people were happy to see me. I said, what? So the person says, no, Che! I'm trying to even find out who's, because I didn't even have my glasses. So I couldn't see. I, I have very acute myopia. I'm very short-sighted. So I really can't see. I have very blood vision. So I said, what, what? And then the person shouts, your leg. I said, what's wrong with my leg? You know, and I look down and my leg is literally sliced open. And it's a, a scar that I proudly display every time I get the chance. My leg was literally, I don't know if you can see that. This is the scar. Yeah, so what happened is I looked down and my leg was literally sliced open. It was the color of your shirt, Pastor Eddie, the white. There was no blood at that point. It was white, white flesh just gaping open. You could see a bit of the bone. I was looking at my leg and I couldn't feel it. That's how drunk I was. Sliced open. And then they, all of a sudden, blood starts gushing out. So they took, they took me to a pharmacy. And I had my drink in my hand. We get to the pharmacy and the lady says, uh, I'm not going to treat this lady until you bring a police report. Because it didn't look like a table had cut me. It looked like something worse had happened. But long story short, she cleaned the wound. I refused that to stitch me because there are three things in life I don't deal with. Injections or pricking me, cockroaches and onions. So I told her, find a way of cleaning. I told her, find a way of cleaning the thing and we move on with life. So my friends paid it because I didn't have the money. And you would think I would have the sense to go find some rest or something. No. Went back to the house party with my bandage on my leg and we drank. And the sad thing is I, I moved with this leg. Yeah? I moved with this leg and it kept getting infected because I was constantly moving. Because I had nowhere to... I was not in one place. I was constantly moving. I didn't have money to change the bandage. I had to change a bandage every two days. A bandage is like 2,000 shillings. I didn't even have 500 to buy a chapati. So at one point, I think the bandage just fell off and I was walking around with, you know, this wound and everything. But by God's grace, uh, in this time, uh, after my brother died, his body arrived in Uganda. I was so broke, I couldn't go for the burial. I never buried my brother. Um, it, it really broke my heart, but it's something I came to terms with. I really, I, I looked around and I asked people, somebody help me with 10,000 so that I can make it and bury my brother. And the funny thing is, everyone I asked didn't give me money, but they gave me a beer. You know, it was, it, 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 it is just what it is. But by God's grace, in 2020, February, um, I received some money from UNRWA. UNRWA was constructing a road where my mother was buried. So they have to compensate the, the children or the family of the people who are there. And so I received my portion of the money. But because I didn't have an active bank account, the last time I had an active bank account was about four years pre prior. And so they sent the money to my brother's bank account. And so he looked for me because I didn't have a phone. He looked for me in all the bars that were along a certain beer stretch. And he found me. And he told me, this is what's on ground. This money has arrived. If you want it, find your way to my office because there was a bank branch next to it. It says, I've signed for you, withdraw money, you go and do things. But the first order of business, he told me, go look for a house. He gave me money for movement, border, broker. Went, I found a house, paid four months. Um, by God's grace, I got a, a roof over my head. 
Uh, the next word of business, get a phone, you know. And that's how I started to establish myself. You know, this is Feb. And this time I said, Manche, it's a new start. You know, it was good to be able to have a, a cold shower, you know, be able to put... I was in that house for a long time with just pillow, pillows, an extension, and a mattress, and a bed cover. And I was comf... You couldn't disturb me. That peaceful. And so... Over time, uh, I started to apply for jobs. I was ready to get my life together. I bought clothes. I bought clothes. Pastor Eddie, I bought clothes. And then they announced COVID lockdown. I had nowhere to wear clothes. <laughs> I was so sad. You know, and it was, it was painful because I was really looking forward to working again. Because all these years, like, I, I really felt... I really felt I could not express myself because that's, that's why I was always working in creative spaces. And so lockdown happens. Um, at this point, some of the, ma the money is a little bit that's the remaining. There's just a little bit of money remaining. And yeah, that was that's those small four rooms in lockdown in the pandemic. That was a rehabilitation center where it was just God and I. It was a crushing because I ran out of money. This is now the, the pandemic. I couldn't ask. I used to, before I would tell people, hey, help me with 10K, help me with 20K, and you know, and someone sends you 10K, 20K. Now it's help me with 10K and portend you, ah, things are tight. It was tight for everyone. So I had no money for, let alone food, for alcohol and cigarettes. And so the withdrawals started, you know. And it got to a point which was so bad. I was having lucid dreams. I was waking up and I was sleepwalking. I would wake up and I find myself facing a wall and holding a matchbox. Like I'm trying to walk into a wall with a matchbox. Basically, in my sleep, I was trying to look to light a cigarette or something. You know, it became so bad. But in this time, I reached a point where I couldn't go north. I couldn't go west. I couldn't go southeast. I said, God, if you spit me out on the... If... I get spat out in the streets, I am not going to make it back alive because there are so many other incidents that happen. I really shouldn't be alive today. I, to be honest, people who see me, and I'm very, when, if someone ever asks me to tell my testimony, I never shy away because I know for a fact it's God who kept me alive. I have, I have no business being alive after what I've been through. And so it was in that time where you know, they say when you hit rock bottom, there's nowhere else to go but up. And God pushed me to that point where I could depend on nothing else but him. And, you know, that's, that's, that's really where the testimony is. In, in knowing that, um, I, love, I love the fact that PSM chose um, Beautiful Ashes as the title for this. Because at this point in life, I had, I had given up on myself. That's why I was willing to drink myself literally to death. Um, I had a second uh, abortion, actually. This one almost took my life. My friend Nala, who was speaking, is the, is the person who um, I was dealing with me in that time. It literally almost took my life. This was 2019. Literally almost took my life. And, with, and many, many other incidents. But family had given up on me. My friends had given up on me. I had given up on myself. But one thing is that when God is beautifying something, he doesn't beautify beautiful things. God takes things that have been downcast and downtrodden, and he shines them and refines them in that when people see you, even when they look at you and hear you tell your story, they say, ah. ah. And that's what it's supposed to be, you know. And... For me, it was coming to the point of realization that, that truth, truth is the catalyst of freedom. For a very long time, um, I had lived at the, knowing at the back of my mind that I had no, no value. I ha there was no purpose for me to play in life, you know, that it was the end of the road for me. There is nothing beyond this point. If you go beyond this point, it's death, you know, so you might as well waste away. And if you ever see somebody who is dealing with any form of bondage, be it an addiction to something, or any form of bondage, know that deception has crept in. And this, this, 
this is something that I wish we could speak a lot more because a lot of these issues that we deal with, things like addiction, things like um, sexual perversion, things like uh, depression, there's a reason why the enemy wants them hidden so much because truth is what leads to freedom. Let me tell you, two days before this book was launched, a family member called me and asked me, how many copies of this book have you printed? And I told them the copies. And they said, I want to buy all of them so that this story doesn't come out. And it wasn't even because of my testimony. It was because I was speaking the truth that people had been running away from of the pattern of addiction that was in our family. And at that point, I realized and knew there's a reason the enemy is fighting this book. I said, Things do, this is my first book. It's not perfect. I said, God, this book, you're the, you're the one who put this book on my heart. My face is on that cover. My name is on that cover. But God, this book is your weapon. Whoever fights it is fighting you. And I left it at that. And the testimonies, it's not even a month. The testimonies, I walked into a rehab center. I never went to rehab. Doesn't mean that I'm better than anybody else. I went through my own rehabilitation with God. Rehabilitation means restoration, bringing something back to original settings. And I went to a rehab center and I asked God, God, what am I going to tell these people? I don't know, Simona, 12-step program, 9-step, what, what? I went, but you know, when I went there and I saw what they were doing, I said, this is what God had me do in those four walls that he had me when he was crushing me. Before sessions, they sit and they say, I, would, I, I will not use today, I did not use today, I shall not use today. Over and over again, they chant it. Why is this? Because we are always walking around with battles in our mind. You understand? And in the book of Romans, it says, transform, um, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. A transformation can never take place if you do not renew your pattern of thinking. Which is why when you read John chapter 8, verse 32, it says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free, not set you free because when something is set free, it can be captured. But when you're made of freedom, when your mind comes to know, that the truth shall make you free, and you realize not what the truth is, but who the truth is. There's nothing that can have mastery over you. It was in, in understanding and knowing what the word of God was saying about me that I knew that let God be true and every man a liar, that I will never listen to what, even what I was saying, even what I was saying to myself. When the Bible tells you that the heart is deceitful above all things, there's a reason why Jesus, when the Spirit of God was upon him, he went to heal the brokenhearted. Because if our heart is, if, 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 if the soul is still fragmented, it cannot fully express what the Spirit of God wants to through you. Which is why I want to commend Watoto Church very much, because this is not just a hyper-spiritual place where they tell you, come and we speak tongues and what's holding you will go. No. If you do not understand that a human being operates in three dimensions, leave the work of God. A human being is spirit, a human being is soul, a human being is flesh. After dealing with the spiritual aspect, you need to deal with their emotions, with their mind, and their well-being. After that, go and deal with restoration of the body because the substances or whatever bondage they have been in has affected them. After Jesus raised the girl from the dead, he said, give her something to eat. Why? He acknowledged that there needs to be a physical. And this is very important. Thank you so much, Watoto Church. Um, you know, let me just even shamelessly plug and say, if you need counseling and therapy, it's, it's, it's free here at Watoto Church. Please, whatever you're going through, come here. It won't just be prayer, but they'll, they'll definitely help you, restore you to original settings. And in a world where we are daily sold the benefits of bondage. You know how dishonest the enemy is? The enemy is such a dishonest salesman. He yep. sells you the benefits of bondage, but he never tells you what happens when you disobey God. Yeah. Very yeah. dishonest salesman. And that's why we, we need to walk in truth. We need to walk with the word of, listen, whatever God has not said is a lie. It doesn't matter if it's your identical twin who has said it. If God has not said it, it's a lie. That's very, very good. Can we get up for Che? Come on. Thank you. I mean, this is just a summary of her story. There's a lot that should have said you could see her just shut up and let her speak. And even in this, she's just touched like a tithe of her story. 
Now, if you want to just know more about our story, there's a book right here, and uh, you'll find it in the foyer. Uh, let's support her work, because when I believe when you support this work, it's going to enable this story to set other people free, because they overcame by the word of their testimony. That's what the Bible says. And so, Che, thank you so much for really coming and sharing your story with us. And uh, this is God's story, and there is power in a redeemed story. Because all of us have stories. The difference is the redemption of your story. That's what makes a difference. And that's what she talks about, what she went through in those four walls, in that room, God, Jesus, redeemed her story. Now, our time really is spent. I want to say thank you so much. Che will be in the foyer to sign your copies. And so come on, let's give it up for Che tonight. And thank you so much for being... As she takes her seat... Thank you. Come on. Amazing. We're almost done, but I believe this is equally an important opportunity. And um, as I ended there, there is power in your redeemed story. You have a story. And I believe as she was sharing her story, the things that the Holy Spirit just awakened in your life, possibly... You can relate to her story because there's some stuff you're going through. Or maybe there's some things you have done and you're feeling shame and guilt. And you think you are wasted. God can never do anything in you, through you. But today's story can, is really a testimony that there is never anyone who is wasted as long as you offer yourself to Jesus. He will make you of. Amen. And that's what I love about telling our stories and bringing that amazing piece of every story, which makes a difference, Jesus redeeming the story. Now, the Japanese have art, and it's called Kintsuji, I think, if I, if I have uh, gotten it right. And so you're going to see, and this is what they do. Now, that is a port, and possibly looks a little bit strange because this is Japanese, not African. But when their plates and this art, they get broken pieces of plates, pots, jars that ordinarily when it breaks you through away because when something is broken, it's good for nothing because it is delicate to make these pots and so some people throw them away but they found a way of restoring them, rehabilitating these pots and what they do is they pick every piece of this broken pot or jar or plate or glass or cup and they will put it together using gold and when they have put it together that final pot becomes more valuable than it was before it is more valuable it's more expensive it is something that people pay loads of money to get but the only way it can get value is first it must be broken but somebody who sees what it can become restores it with something expensive gold and the final piece is way more valuable than the original piece in the same way, all of us in this room, we are broken. Sin breaks all of our lives. If I pass this microphone all around this place and I ask, what's your story? If you're honest, you would say, I'm broken. I'm addicted. I'm struggling. I'm feeling guilty. There is shame. I've been rejected. I've been called every kind of word. I don't feel a sense of purpose. I don't know who I am today. We are all broken. Because we live in a broken world. That has been broken because of sin. And sin has consequences. But the beautiful thing is, just like those broken pieces of that port that is put together by a careful craftsman using an amazing 
element called gold. We have God who made us before the foundation of the world, who loves us so much, who has always been pursuing us from Genesis. And we see in the New Testament, Jesus comes and then he lays down his life. And like the porter, who is a whole person, bring these pieces together, Jesus actually was broken. He laid down his life. He literally laid down his and he shed blood. And this blood of Jesus is so precious that when you trust in that amazing sacrifice of Jesus, the blood of Jesus puts your life together and you become a redeemed person, a restored person, a rehabilitated person. And God gives you an amazing story like Che, a story that you should not be ashamed of. But if you embrace Jesus, God begins to do a work in your life and through your work that you have never even imagined. That is the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. That he takes the broken pieces of our lives and puts them together and writes a beautiful story. That is Che's story. That is my story. That is Pastor Brian's story. That is the story of many people are going to be seeing here. In this moment, I want to invite you to the one who is able to make us over with perfect blood not gold that pot eventually will break again until it cannot be made over again but you you can never break down to a place that you can never be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ and so maybe you're in this place and you say you have tried many times hey this is another time Jesus' arms are wide open say hey come I died. I shed my blood. My body was broken so your body could be made whole. I want to invite you to Jesus today. Let's bow our heads all across this place. If you're watching online, again, you sense God is speaking to you right now. There's a link that is going to show up in the chat section and click it. If you want to give your heart to Jesus, say, Jesus, here I am. Make me over. Jesus wants to do that. Click that link. And one of, our, one of us is going to get in touch with you, pray with you, so that we can all grow together. Now in this place, you're in this place, you say, Pastor, today, I'm broken. I need God to make me over. Would you lift up your hand wherever you are? Just lift up that hand and say, today, come on. Lift up that hand say, I'm broken. I need just to make me over. Lift up that hand. There's no shame in this place. Remember, the only place that the devil wants to keep you is in a place of secrecy. Right now, truth can only set you free when you say, here I am, Jesus. Right now, God wants to set you free. Lift up the hand and say, today, I want to receive that miracle. God, to make me over. Upstairs, all over this auditorium, I see hands up. And God sees what is in your heart. But again, thank you so much for raising that hand because you're saying, hey, I made business. This is my day. This is my moment. Father, you see every hand that has been raised before you today and you know what is in their hearts you know every part of their lives and how broken they are and you know the voices they hear each and every day of condemnation of shame guilt rejection but today oh god i'm praying may they sense an embrace may they sense a love that is unconditional may they sense an acceptance may they sense a forgiveness a wholeness that only comes because jesus you understand what they're going through so god i'm praying that instead of ashes May they sense beauty, joy, and peace. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, I do pray. And everybody say it, amen. Come on. Let's, come on. Let's just welcome us. Let's just clap for our friends. I've said, hey, raise their hand to Jesus. Thank you so much for uh, really coming tonight. And right now, I'm going to invite Pastor Brian. Pastor Brian. Oh, you are here. Now you're there. All right. Here we go. All right, Pastor Brian. Let's welcome Pastor Brian, the man in black. Fantastic. Come on, Pastor X Money. Let's give a big clap to Pastor Eddie for hosting today. Let's give a big hand clap to Che for sharing her story. Awesome. Make sure you grab a copy of that book right after here Woman, Fire, Grace. Wow, the grace of God is so powerful. Once again, Che, thank you for sharing your story today. Really blessed, really, really blessed. And uh, wow. I know that story is going to be had all around Uganda because that's a story of God's grace. 
really powerful story. Going to set many people free. Wow. Have you had an awesome time today at Past Sex Money? I tell you, we ought to give a big hand clap to Jesus that turns stories around. Amazing. It's been absolutely amazing. And uh, hey, maybe you lifted up your hand and gave your heart to Jesus. This is what I want you to do. At the end of our time together today, for those of you who are here in person, all you have to do is walk right through that door. There is a lounge right there and some of our pastors are going to be there to connect with you. You have just made the most important decision of your life. We want to help you get started. So we have some material for you. Please make sure that you connect with us. If you're here for your very, very, very first time, again, walk right through those doors who want to connect with you. For those of you who are joining us online, you gave your heart to Jesus. All you have to do is find that emoji, lift up that hand, just wave and say, I gave my life to Jesus. One of our hosts is going to get in touch with you. If you're here for your first time and joining us online, do write to us, connect at Watoto. Church.com. Well, we're getting ready to close tonight, but I just want to remind you about something that is so important. At Watoto was so committed to disciple you to become an influencer, a godly transformational leader who's taking the culture and character of Christ into the core of your community. One of the ways we do that is through a program we call Launchpad. It is launching you into the place where God wants you to go. So we want to make sure we invest in you the skills that are necessary for you to thrive in the marketplace, in your career, in your vocation, and what God has called you to do. So I want to encourage you to sign up for Launchpad. Pass by the tables. Ask for the Launchpad table. It is a short program and it is not very expensive but I promise you once you've gone through it you'll be so thankful for the skills that you have received as you go into the world and make a difference right there so make sure that you do that make sure you stop by the tables uh, grab a copy of Machelli's book take a picture with her as well just as a silver or just share with your friends and let them know I met her in person we can't wait to connect with anyone that's here for the first time have you given your heart to jesus i want to encourage you to rise up right now for those of you who are here in person i want you to rise up to your feet we're going to close together come on will you help me turn to your neighbor you're going to look at them in the blackest spot of their eye and you're going to pray that powerful prayer upon them which we call the grace and you turn to your neighbor look into the blackest bluest or greenest or brownest spot of their eye and say to them and now may the grace of our lord jesus christ and the love of god and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you next Friday at the evening of prayer.